What's up guys? Welcome back to the Strong Sisters YouTube channel. In today's video, we are very fortunate to be able to interview probably one of the most well-known farmers, Joel Salatin. So Joel co-owns along with his family, Polyface Farms, a regenerative farm in Virginia. So Joel educates, entertains, and inspires audiences across the world, and he is well-versed on a number of topics. Joel has published 12 books, including Pastured Poultry Profits and Salad Bar Beef. Joel is also the editor of The Stockman Grass Farmer, a magazine dedicated to the art and science of making a profit on grass-based agriculture. So Joel is commonly on the road speaking, inspiring, educating others. However, for this interview, we caught him when he was back at Polyface Farms, which is in a rural town in Virginia. I'm sure many of you all are aware the service is not always the greatest in small rural towns, one of the beauties of rural America. So the audio and video quality is not the greatest in this video. He commonly freezes for the video. However, we fixed up the audio and we are really excited to share this conversation with you all. So I really hope you guys enjoy. I really apologize for the technology difficulties to get started, um, but I really appreciate your time uh, coming on our channel. We value yeah, your content cool. and your message very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am a big fan of one of the first books I read regarding like farming was Folks to St. Normal. And ever since then, I realized that I am just <laughs> too influenced by everything in this world yeah. and that I really needed to change my ways. So that was a big influence for us getting out here and getting some property of our own and starting what we're trying to start. Yeah. We are uh, two girls that grew up in the burbs, that's yes. for sure. Very cool, yeah. very cool. Okay, so as like a starting question okay. for our listeners who may not be familiar, who is Joel Salton? Yeah, okay, so I, I, am a, I am a Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic farmer. I love it. That's great. Okay. You have certainly been like inspiring for us, like she said, to kind of get away from where our like roots were in the suburbs, grocery store, like not really doing any hands-on like farm or land work into a rural town. And we are experiencing the difficulties and some challenges of rural town America right now with technology. Um, but before getting into like kind of a bigger picture question, I need you to help us set the scene real quick. So if you can chat a little bit about how the conventional meat system works so, for example, like how we get from farms to the meat packages, for example, at Walmart. So what the kind of average American doesn't really understand, how we get from these smaller farms to these kind of less expensive, cheaper meats at like Walmart stores. So the conventional beef system. So, so the first thing is to realize that eat stuff. I mean, like they, they eat stuff. And so where does that food come from? So that food is produced on farms. Most of it is corn and soybeans, mm -hmm. but corn and soybeans need to eat something too. And so where does that food come from? Well, generally it comes from chemical fertilizers. So you have, so you have chemical fertilizers made from petroleum that worms and uh, mycorrhizae and the soil food web to grow the crops to feed the animals that are in confinement houses, those large factory, you know, uh, confinement houses that are the size of a, of a football field, two, two football fields even. Thousands and thousands of animals crammed in here, eating grains that have been raised on chemical fertilizers in soil that's been deadened by, by the chemicals. And then those animals then go into, uh, when they're finally uh, finished, they, uh, um, and of course, the while they're being raised in these confinement facilities, of course, they're breathing in, you know, fecal particulate air, they're uh, emotionally as stressed like you would be if you lived in a, uh, in a football, football stadium full of people all your life. And uh, they, they, they eat out of their toilet because it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's extremely unclean. Everything is covered with manure, with manure dust. So imagine all of your food, all of your plate, all of your air being, um, you know, uh, particulate of, of manure. All right. And, um, and, and so then when they're done there, then they go to great big centralized processing facilities 
where they are then, um, you know, uh, uh, slaughtered in, in mass, you know, just in mass, uh, parted out, fabricated in those packages, then arrive on the supermarket shelf uh, for you to purchase. That's that's kind of the, the, the chain of custody uh, that goes from the soil all the way to your plate. That does not sound like something that is good for would, our health and good for the animal health no. and good for the soil health. And it, or and that it, most people realistically would want to support. I just feel like they don't understand or want to know what's actually going on. Because um, if you take your average person and you told them that, and then you said that that's what you're buying in the store, like our mom, for example, I don't think she would want to continue. Um, but the only way they're going to see that is if they watch like one of those propaganda films that paints like all the entire meat industry as negative like that when re in reality there is a better solution so with with like the current conventional beef system there's like those four or five centralized meat companies like jbs and then for in the pork industry like smithfield and tyson and these are largely foreign owned and operated and they these large four or five companies um, process like 80 to 90 percent of the meat in our country and so after COVID, well, where do you see this meat industry headed? Yeah, well, I, I don't see I don't see any uh, changes in the offing. I think it's going to continue to. I mean, the, the industry as we know it, um, and and you're exactly correct. Foreign owned, uh, you know, eighty to ninety percent of all of the uh, meat it, it comes through those four uh, big big outfits. Um, two of which are foreign owned. I don't see that changing at all. Uh, I mean, except to just continue to get more, you know, to, to use more sterilizers, more antimicrobials, uh, irradiation, you know, more techniques to try to, to, uh, whatever compensate for, for filth, for filth. Um, what, what is exciting, what is exciting is that this new, uh, fragility that we see in industry that we saw in uh, empty supermarket shelves last spring, um, that fragility is having a, a, a powerful effect on, on sourcing, on vending and sourcing. And so what we're seeing is, a, is an increased interest in consumers of, of authentic, secure food sources, food sources that aren't as subject to um, to these large centralized processing facilities that are where um, thousands of people congregate every day in cold, damp conditions with no fresh air and uh, 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 that, that's conducive to disease. Whereas in a small uh, local slaughterhouse with, you know, 15 to, to 30, 30 people working in it um there there's there's a co there's a completely different pathogen a different pathogen environment and uh, and these facilities have largely been immune immune to the uh the fragilities of large centralized processors so I, I think there is more awareness and your questions obviously indicate more awareness of this fragility and as people begin making that shift, uh, hopefully it will uh, start to chip in to the to the control and the power of these uh, these four large uh, centralized processors. So I, I just worry a little bit that this conventional um, beef and also just conventional food system has really made consumers like used to cheap and abundant food. Like that's kind of almost what they want. And so I view it to be a little bit challenging for small regenerative farms, for example, to offer these uh, food products at a higher price. So in this type of environment where you have these large meat producers and then you also have these group of consumers who are used to cheap food, how do small farmers better position themselves for the future in this type of environment? Well, welcome to the world of marketing and messaging. <laughs> <laughs> and so we consistently explain to our to our people um, not only the nutritional benefits 
uh, of our of our food. I mean, for example, for example, our beef uh, carries three hundred percent more riboflavin than than uh, feedlot, you know, uh, conventional beef. Uh, uh, one yes. of our eggs, one of, uh, for example, um, if you test the nutrition of one of our eggs. Uh, the the USDA you know regular label is uh, like 48 micrograms of folic acid per egg, which is really important for pregnant women. Folic acid is a really important uh, um, nutrient for for pregnant women. Um, and and uh, our eggs our eggs instead of being just 48 micrograms per egg, our eggs averaged 1,000 1,038 micrograms per egg. So, so the fact is that, that we just have to quality, efficient quality, the ecological benefits, uh, the carbon, all the things surrounding the industrial food system, we have to explain, we are the alternative. We, we absolutely are the alternative. I mean, even, even for, for methane, you know, the, the methanotrophic bacteria in, in, uh, in pasture, um, uh, gobbles up and consumes twice the amount of methane that a cow can ever produce. But it's but methanotrophic bacteria does not live in a cornfield. It does not live in a feedlot. It does not live in a parking lot. It, it does not live in these kinds of areas. And so struggle this great struggle for uh, for market understanding and acceptance. Uh, our side consistently looks at at the science, the messaging, to help people to understand that the price you're paying for food in the supermarket does not compensate for the externalized costs to the environment, to your health, to animal welfare, to ethics, to morality. You know, all of those things are compromised by the cheap food in the supermarket. Yeah. You brought, you brought up a great point about the like cow burps, right? So that's like the biggest thing that a lot of people target against animal agriculture, um, huge methane producers, but they forget that these studies where they're monitoring and measuring methane is so out of context where it's really hard to measure an entire ecosystem where the cow, let's say it does have some burps. Well, the, like you said, there's the methanotropic bacteria in the soil that are actually breaking down a lot of that methane. And so I think the context gets uh, it, it's hard to really measure an entire ecosystem in these studies. And so I think, like you said, messaging is, and marketing is important. However, I do know that you have said in the past that you believe that social media is kind of a waste of time. How else... Yeah, because of balance. <laughs> I, yeah, how else... So your answer of like, it's it's our job as farmers to be able to communicate these ideas, principles, and messages to our potential consumers. <laughs> I just like the next generation right. is mm. growing up on social media. Like it's just ingrained and it's part of who they are. And so I think that's part of the problem though. Yeah. One the of the fact that we're growing up on social media and then we're influenced by everything we see. But in order to be successful in this type of environment, I think that a farmer needs to recognize that. And <laughs> that's our role. That, How do we fix this? <laughs> so, so Joel, honestly, one of our biggest goals is to help educate um, the next generation in yeah. these type of matters. But <clears throat> we yes. personally, I, we personally get distracted with social media. Um, we are outside filming our chickens, like eating compost. And it's like, that probably wasn't the right. best use of our time. So if you were to give advice to a um, mm. small farmer about how to best use social media and not waste time, what would what advice would you give him or her? As, as you know, there are, there are definitely um, uh, different types of social media. For example, um, you almost can't have a business today unless you have a website. Right. So, you know, we, we don't generally consider web site as social media, but it very much is. A website is, is an, electric, an electronic doorway into your persona, your message, and your business. And so, um, uh, so our Polyface, our Polyface website, polyfacefarms.com, um, it, it is a window into, I mean, we have there our value system, we have there our, our, our uh, principles of belief, 
uh, of course, how you buy product, how you can visit the farm, you know, all the stuff about us is on that website. So that is a part of social media. Um, as far as Facebook and Instagram, and, and I don't even know all the, I'm not on any of that stuff. I don't even have a smartphone, but, but, um, but. You know, we do have an Instagram and Facebook account, which we put on, you know, pretty pictures of chickens and cows and, 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 and we, we tell, we, we tell some stuff, but I can tell you here at our farm, what we know, what we know that really, uh, gets people converted, if you will, converted, um, is that if we can get them to either see it or taste it and preferably both. So we do a tremendous amount of farm events. We do everything. We have playground for children. We have a playground for children with tire swings and teeter totters and a, a corn box to play in. And, and we, we, we do everything we possibly can to get, to get families and children to want to come to the farm. Uh, we want, we want to act a child's, uh, we'd rather have children want to come here and go to Disney uh, because we're real. We're real. Believe it, it, it. It's real. They can come here. They can touch the animals. They can pick up a, a again. They can pick a, a, a tomato, um, and, and, and it's real. And so, uh, so we do a lot. To we do events. We do farm tours. We do hayride tours. Uh, we do a lot of things to try to get people, you know, out to the farm uh, in order to see it, taste it, smell it, to connect to it. Right. Finding that connection is so important. And I feel like you're just talking about a real experience. So going out to the farm and meeting the animals. Getting and, good bacteria. Yeah. Um, on the flip side of that, we have the new fake experience of meat, like the Beyond Meat and the 3D printed meat. And it seems like the plant-based agenda while we are talking about the downsides of social media, they've really taken over social media. And so they far more effectively and efficiently get their message out than I would say regenerative farmers, unfortunately. Although you, Ashley and myself probably live in this corner of the internet where all we see is like, oh, grass fed meat, go to the farm, buy from your local farmer. That's just like what we choose to, um, to engage, engage with. However, most people are not seeing that. So what is your, advice i guess for somebody who is so inundated with this plant-based agenda that that's all they see they don't even understand that there is this other alternative for farming on the side that is better for their family's health so how do you have that discussion to transfer yeah how do you have that discussion for somebody to understand and then also what do you just think about that in general the whole 3d printed meat thing going on about like it no more too... meat in <laughs> 2032 or something yeah well first of all First of all, uh, you two, you two need to have a um, um, hundred million followers, and if you two had a hundred million followers, we we would have we would have a different world. Okay, um, so I, I mean, the, the question is valid. It's it, it's a profound question because it's it's a it's a question that doesn't it doesn't just speak to food. It's the truth. How do you how how does a person make a choice? How does a person make a choice to to embrace truth? And 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 the fact is that civil humans have been faced with this conundrum forever. I mean, who who believed who believed that the world was round when everybody thought it was flat? Who believed that 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 women should vote when nobody thought women should vote? Who believed that slavery was wrong when everybody thought slavery was okay? You know what I mean. You, yeah. you can go down your you can go down your list of things, and so to, so here we are today. Today we're in the same. We're, we're faced with these choices, and we're faced with a choice of how do you view the world? Is is, is the world is ecology? Um, is ecology uh, primarily a a mechanical? A mechanical thing that we that that we like a machine that we uh, pull DNA and we, we restructure it and we manipulate it, or or is life more like more biological in that it's less mechanical and more 
um, more spontaneous, dynamic, um, mis mystical even. Uh, you know, we could say mystical. It, you know, I mean, it's the, the fact the fact that you and I, the fact that you and I have a quadrillion exchanges of relationships in our bodies going on every millisecond. So think of that. A quadrillion decisions are being made in our body every millisecond. That is a that is an incredible thought of of relational dynamic biological activity. And and so so to embrace that embraces the collective wisdom of nature, the the cosmos uh, uh, design, okay, uh, it, it, of life, um, and and to say, oh well, we can just we can just go in and manipulate this and manipulate that, and and we can pull this DNA out and we can fix that and fix that like it like it like it's like it's a car part <laughs> like like we can just uh, take a take a pig apart or a chicken apart like we can a car apart that that is a a worldview choice of simplicity and and hubris hubris uh arrogance if you will toward the complexity and the diverse of life that is fundamentally incorrect in how we interact with our ecological umbilical we we are tied to this ecological umbilical whether you like it or not and 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 there are many people very smart people think that we're smart enough to disconnect from this ecological umbilical that we can somehow go into a star trek a star trek universe of of, of manufactured stuff and and our cells won't care our microbiome won't care our red blood cells won't care and, and our bacteria won't care and and actually they do care they care very very much and uh that's one reason you know when i was a kid we got three vaccines today you get 72 vaccines and we have gone when i was a kid i didn't know a single person who had a food allergy i didn't know a single person who had autism i didn't know a single diabetic I, I knew maybe one person who had cancer and, and today, today, all of these things, these autoimmune diseases, I mean, we never heard of Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, brain fog. I mean, I mean, name your thing. We didn't know anybody like that. And so as we have gone down the factory farming approach, the chemical the chemical fertilizer approach, the pesticide approach, the herbicide approach, the vaccine approach, the 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 fabricated food, the three D, the meat laboratory. I mean, all of that is the same pathway, and it is leading us to to nature inventing new words: E. coli, salmonella, you know, food <laughs> allergy, and this is a new language where nature where it's on its knees saying enough <laughs> enough you know and and the fact and, and the question is are we listening are we listening to nature joel i, I think we're gonna run out of words soon yeah we're, i love that i like <laughs> that you brought up the nutritional aspect of it too because um <laughs> while we can i guess create this substance in a lab so the meat that might have some sort of protein that's coming from whatever it's coming from, that same piece of meat does not necessarily have those bioavailable vitamins and especially minerals that are gonna come from grass-fed no. animal proteins that we get from the farm. And so while we can still maybe feed the world with calories, we're largely just still going to be nutrient deficient. And that's where you see all these new terms coming up. So the autoimmune diseases, IBS, all those problems because our microbiomes are not satisfied we are not fueling our body with the nutrients we need to optim to function function optimally that's right yeah and we have an obese and malnourished nation right and then on top of that we're just like telling people to eliminate the beef and eat more plant-based to solve these problems and yeah. i don't see Th how people don't see that's getting worse 
Yeah, that, 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 is, that is correct. And you're very right. The, the proteins, the proteins and plants, proteins in, um, you know, in actual, uh, you know, authentic, you know, meat uh, protein is uh, quite different. Uh, I love your use of the term bioavailable. That's, a, that's, a, that's an incredibly important term that I'm so appreciative that you understand. Uh, there's a documentary out now, uh, Sacred Cow, mm -hmm. Sacred Cow, that deals with a lot of this. I want to deal with one little thing, one little thing that you brought up that, that I want to touch, and that is feeding the world and, and how do we do this. Our farm, let me tell you, our farm um, produces way more per square yard than an average uh, than an average farm, not because it's small and not because it's large, but because of the management. And the fact is that um, that we we mismanage uh, millions and millions of acres. We overgraze, we plow, we desertify, we de we deplete aquifers. Uh, there are all sorts of things that assaults assaults that we make of earth. And then we wonder where the abundance is. The fact is that we believe in scaling, not by a centralized empire, but scale up by, by expanding a centralized uh, a hub system, or you can scale up by, by duplicating many, you know, many parts, many pieces. And so we believe in scaling so up that, so that for example instead of having a tyson a tyson growing all the chicken we have ten thousand uh farmers growing you know 40 to fifty thousand chickens a year we have ten thousand of them all over the country instead of having you know 150 mega processing facilities uh with four thousand employees canning and processing all of our meat and vegetables why can't we do it doing that? It, it, it's no less efficient, but it, it reduces the carbon footprint of transportation. It creates food security in, in, in our own bioregions. And it also reduces the chain of custody. So you have less chance of pathogens, spoilage, and all that sort of thing developing with these long inventory lines. So I know that your your belief um, is kind of quite on the opposite side of the spectrum of the conventional beef system where everything is centralized in these larger uh, buildings and they really are factory farms. They specialize in one thing. So where do you see the future of regenerative farming? Do you see it as like all independent farms that are producing their own uh, kind of stacked enterprises where they're producing kind of everything? Or more of like partnership styles where, for example, one farm can do like beef and chicken and then the other farm, farm can do like lamb and honey and things like that. And there are more of like partnerships where some farmers who may not be interested in the marketing side could get help from other farmers. Where do you see yes. the future of regenerative farming for it to be successful against this type of centralized system? Uh, yeah, well, you're you're uh, you're very you're very uh, astute, uh, and, and the fact is that most of us do, you know, like to choose things that we're good at, yeah. uh, and we're not good at everything, and so uh, you're exactly right. Um, um, a, a, a team, a team is always stronger than an individual, always, and so, and, and so, uh, yeah. I, if you read, if you've read any of my stuff, you know that I've I've made waves saying I don't think a farm is sustainable unless it has two salaries from two different generations. Um, you know, you, you've got to have some sort of a of a successional uh, plan there. And you, and you're right. Generally, the marketer is not the farmer. Farmers tend to they don't like people generally. You know, <laughs> they they they'd rather uh, have a relationship with their tractor than their you know than their <laughs> spouse. And so, um, and, and so having a diversified, uh, uh, having a diversified team is always better. So yes, I think that the successful ecological high production farms of the future are going to be team oriented, not just individual, whether you call that cooperative, a team, uh, a collaborative, I don't care, but, um, but 
active by themselves as they are with somebody who who they team up with, you know, where you have strengths and weaknesses to be handled by, you know, people with talents and abilities. Uh, teams are always stronger than individuals. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so going back a little bit on what you were saying where there's these big moments in human history where people used to think the earth was flat and, and things like that. Um, and it sounds like we're kind of at this really critical point in history where you've got this huge plant-based agenda. I'm honestly really concerned about the, the cultured meat because it actually is like animal cells that they're growing into meat. So it's not made out of plant protein and things like that. A little bit concerned on the amount of investment money going into, the, into those. Um, it's also a little bit concerning that Bill Gates is now the largest land farmland owner in the United States with over 240,000 acres. And so what it, is he doing with that? I don't, I, I'm not sure. Um, it, we all know that he's very much plant-based because he has uh, invested in impossible foods and beyond meat and things like that. So we really are at this like really important point in history. And I think sometimes this is overwhelming for people. They see this as such a huge issue, like big ag, big food, climate change. Like these are all very large topics and I'm just one individual. So like, what could my actions do? Like, do I really have an impact? What is your biggest advice for both consumers and farmers as to how they can actually play a role in their everyday actions are important for these type of issues? Mm. That's that's one of my favorite questions because you are correct. Some of these things, these these things seem so big that they're overwhelming. And so my answer to that is wherever you are on the on the spectrum, whatever you think, where we are right now as a society, as a world, wherever we are is a result of trillions and trillions of individual decisions made by our ancestors. I mean, this goes back before before the United States, okay? I mean, we're, we're going back in history um, that, that, that where we are this in time is a physical manifestation, a culmination of trillions of centuries of individual decisions, uh, whether to tree or not, whether to, uh, to graze this plant or not, whether to have a cow or not, whether to eat this or not. I mean, all those decisions. And so, so if, if we assume that, then we have to assume that tomorrow's world, tomorrow's world, the world that, that you and I are creating today for our grandchildren, that world will also be a physical manifestation of the culmination of billions of decisions, individual decisions that are made between now and then. And so it truly is a composite of these decisions. So you and I, that's why on our, uh, one of our little monikers on our, um, on our little insulator bags that we give our customers, our little moniker is um, healing the land one bite at a time. That's our little slogan, healing the land one bite at a time, because we, we want to connect the bite. I'm, I'm eating this and we want to connect that what I'm eating has a direct effect on, on the, on the entire landscape, our entire, our entire womb, our entire nest is, 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 is dependent on res, on responsible bites, bite-sized things. So there, there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, metaphors there. And so, um, I speak to power. I speak to your power, to the individual power of someone. And let me just say this about the farmers. There are a lot of farmers like uh, us who are desperate for 10 more customers. You know, there are many farmers who are, are trying to make a living on their the good, good farmers. I'm not talking about the bad farmers. I'm saying the good farmers. They're trying to make a, li a living on their land. Many of them are, are off jobs to try to earn enough so they can stay on their farm. And they're, they're desperate for, for 
10 customers, 12 customers. If I just had 10 or 12 more who really bought into this, I quit my own job, stay home with my family, stay home on the farm, and I could do a lot better. There are thousands of those out there. And so, so my, my, my plea, my plea is to consumers is to, you have the power to shape the marketplace. The only reason McDonald's is as big as they are is because people line up to buy McDonald's. And, 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 and if we, if we quit lining up to buy McDonald's, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be a McDonald's. And so the marketplace always responds to the demand of the marketplace. So ultimately, the farmers are completely dependent on where the marketplace goes. And the marketplace is you, is non-farmers. You have the power. And you make the power every time you make that, that food purchase choice. And so bless you, bless you for to, uh, to challenge the industrial narrative to challenge the um the cult uh, the techno cult and to appreciate that there is you know there is more to this than um you know than just let, let's get let, let's let's get rid of all the cows yeah um <clears throat> you're talking in metaphors and you're talking about how trillions of decisions our ancestors made over time brought us to where we are today well like the same thing applies to your body like you were saying there's trillions of decisions going on every nanosecond and every bite we take can either make us more sick or heal our body and we need to start thinking about what's actually going yeah. to help us heal our body so they co both of these journeys coincide that's actually how Ashley and I got into the farming is because we went on this long health journey um, to heal our bodies from our autoimmune conditions and actually found how powerful animal nutrition is and so I guess if we want to look at it that way, a lot of our audience is also really health inclined. And so they can think about it that way. If, wow. If the impact that they the food they're eating has on their body, their decisions and the food that they're buying from the store has the same impact on our lands. I like that comparison. Just here <laughs> with a comparison. Yes. You're, you're right. If if I could cut if I could cut the screen, I would just give both of you a great big hug. Uh, we, we um, you know, people people like people like me people like me are desperate are desperate for more voices like yours to to touch our culture. I, I don't. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna start to cry in a minute. But that's how that's how profound this is. This is this is not just. I want market share. This isn't just I want a bigger bank. This is this is about healing. If if you don't feel well, and then you you do go through a healing process, um, you know it's a it's a big thing. It, it's not just I prefer this. No, and, and and you want to let people know that you can you can heal, and that's one of the beautiful things about life. You know, versus mechanics. Uh, if if a, if a wheel bearing goes out in your car. Um, you can't just apologize to it and say nice things to it while it healed. Uh, it, it, it's not going to heal. And whether it's healing physically or emotionally through forgiveness, um, we, we do have that capacity to heal. That's the difference between luck and mechanics. That's the difference. Yeah. And I think that something we can both agree on when it comes to healing your body and the land, um, there's a lot of lifestyle choices that have a huge impact on this too. And this is something that I first recognized when I read your book, um, Folks, This Ain't Normal. And you were talking about all these skills that a child should acquire when they're growing up. And I'm going through this list and I'm like, man, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. So I wrote, I actually just pulled this up from last year when I read your book, What I Want My Kids to Know. I want them to drive stick shift tractor, to shoot or trap to collect dead critters, pick up cow poop from yard to save in barn during winter months, how to chop down and gather wood to start a good fire, but the right wood, garden. So these are all things that, you know, we're talking about right now and it's important for us to adopt, but it's also important for these younger generations to pass down to their children so they can acquire these skills and these priorities and morals to understand and make 
these trillions of decisions going into the future to actually make a substantial impact. I'm sure you all are well aware that there a, I'm just going to say it, um, a, a kind of homesteading tsunami. Um, did you catch homesteading tsunami uh, going on in our country right now? Partly because of COVID. Because if if there's one thing, I don't want to get into all the COVID narrative. I, I don't believe a lot of it, but I will tell you that that one thing that COVID has brought to us is a new. Um, a new desire for self-reliance, for home centricity, to uh, what you know, circle the wagons, and I mean, people are baking bread. They are um, making soap. They are, you know, people. We're we're doing this stuff in the home for ourselves. Do it yourself. Self-reliance. There is an ab homestead tsunami going on as part of the urban exodus as well. Uh, people kind of inherently understand, you know, if something's going down, I don't want to be in the middle of a big city. There's there's something inherently protective, nurturing, and secure about having a garden, having a couple of chickens um, to grow some winter food, uh, having a you know a pantry full of your own canned you know foods and and uh, uh, or whatever. You know, th th there's there's a lot of personal uh, confidence and affirmation. And if there's un our culture is is yeah. desperate for right now in, you know, in these uncertain, unsteady times, uh, it, it is confidence and affirmation going forward that I will be able to thrive in these unsteady times. And uh, and so what you're so yeah, um, these these foundational life skills of how to grow something how to fix something, how to build something. I'm encouraging folks, cash in your 401k plan, learn how to build something, grow something, and fix something, or 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 get to a place where you are with people who who have skill, practical knowledge, and relationship so that we can create communities of reliance and security in times of unsettled in, in times of unsettledness um you know that's a that's a really important thing and more and more people are, are absolutely coming to it so our our ultimate decision to move from we were in central illinois out to this small rural town in michigan um was very much focused like we got into regenerative agriculture from health as as sarah said and then we really do want to play a role and a part in educating the next generation like about these farming principles and practices that do take care of the soil and take care of the health of humans and of the animals. Um, and so curious on your advice for how you would carry through with improving the health of our land while also growing nutrient dense food. So we, acqu we acquired about 22 acres and it's in Southwest Michigan, so we have pretty good soil here. Um, and however, like 20 of those acres have been used for conventional corn and soy crop rotation. So I imagine other people are probably gonna start acquiring these types of fields because we're running out of land ultimately. And so it's important for us to take these conventionally raised crop fields and convert them to perennial pastures, improve soil health, improve carbon sequestration. What would, you do if you acquired this type of property what would be your priority would you seed um, would you combine seeding and putting chickens out there what would your first steps be well the um the first step is to identify uh where you want your personal you know your personal vegetable garden um because there's a, a th there's a different plan for where you're going to have your pastured livestock versus your own personal garden. Now your own personal garden won't have to be very big, but my, my point is you can afford, you can afford to invest a lot in getting your own personal vegetables uh, uh, up and going, extra carbon, uh, wood chips, leaves, all, all soil fertility runs on carbon. So, so, um, so however you can get more carbon uh, there is is positive. Now the outlying the outlying pastures the three you're going to have animals on. Yeah, I would certainly plant a 
a, a mixed uh, polyculture of, of um, grasses, forbs, uh, we'll call it a cocktail, you know, maybe uh, 20 different varieties of things. Now, there will, there will be weeds and things come up, but that's fine. The animals will eat most of them. What you want is you want to get that land closed. Uh, you don't want naked soil. You want that land closed with with vegetation, with green material, and, um, and and so that'll be that would be your outlying fields, and then where your uh, where your garden is, um, that'll probably be you know some sort of beds that you really dump on some leaf chips and maybe some old junk hay. Just get carbon wherever you can to build up that garden soil as fast as you possibly can with carbon. Um, that, I mean, that, that, that's the place to start. That's not the ending, but it certainly is a place to start. Normally, corn and soybean ground will have residual, residual nutrition. I mean, as far as just, you know, nitrogen, the minerals, nitrogen, potassium, uh, phosphorus, it, it'll generally have, um, you know, a residual of that, that what it lacks is biology and biology needs needs decomposing material to live yeah okay that yeah we're going to be seeding here soon it's ultimately winter here um so there's not much we can do right now but our plan is to get chickens and seed and then eventually get some lamb out there but i like i like we hadn't even thought about the fact that we need to get our own garden started because we're over here talking about being like self-sustainable but i still have this list of how i haven't learned how to garden <laughs> So that was a great point. We need to consider that in the spring so we can start relying on ourselves more fully. So put some green pants on our soil, make sure it's not naked, <laughs> and start our own vegetable farm. Um, yeah. But speaking of awesome. vegetables, our audience is very like yeah. health oriented. Uh, they like hearing about like full days of eating and food. So what does a full day of eating look like for Joel Salatin? Uh, for me, okay, so a full day of eating for me be um i've always been a big breakfast guy because i've always gone out at daybreak and done you know an hour or two of chores and then i come in for breakfast okay so so well, i'm up for an hour or two before breakfast and so um so my breakfast is a hearty breakfast i mean we're talking you know raw milk um you know juice uh you know tomato juice apple juice grape juice from our from our grapevines tomato juice from our tomatoes, apple juice from our, you know, apple trees. Um, uh, and then you've got your pro, uh, eggs. I mean, we, we, uh, I love uh, eggs any way you want to fix them. Um, you know, poached, scrambled omelets. I don't care. Uh, usually sausage, bacon, uh, often some fruit, you know, maybe an apple or a, or a banana or something like that. So hearty breakfast. Then, then uh, lunch. Um, lunch is kind of, uh, uh, on the run usually, you know, just a kind of a, a snacky lunch, maybe, a maybe a few slices of cheese and an apple, or maybe if there's some leftover, um, you know, heat up, a heat up a, a bit of leftovers, you know, a casserole or, um, uh, something like that, you know, a little bit, but, but it, we've never, we've never fixed lunch. You know, we, we, yeah. we do, we do a sit down breakfast. And then lunch is when, when, when Teresa gets her break, she, she takes a bit of it. When I get mine, I take it and we just kind of on the run. And then supper is another sit down. Uh, and, and, um, that's usually, you know, a couple of uh, vegetables, you know, potatoes, broccoli, you know, we, we make our own applesauce. Um, we, of course we all have all the different kinds of meat and, um, usually there will be a meat in that, in that supper. Um, and a couple of vegetables and some, you know, some, maybe some, uh, some fermented something, sauerkraut, kimchi. Uh, we, we ferment, um, we make radish, uh, radish ferments in the spring and Teresa, you know, cans that. And, um, you know, just, a th those are almost eaten like condiments. You, you just a little bit of it gets you all that good bugs uh, in your, you know, in your body, a little bit of that, you know, lacto that fermented stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, so yeah, uh, we, I don't, I don't eat as much now as I did when I was, you know, your age, but, um, 
uh, but I don't work as hard. I don't work as hard either. I do a little more brain work today. But yeah, th- that's a that's a day for us. And Teresa's a wonderful cook. And uh, the only thing the only thing I make are omelets. You know, uh, I'll, I'll make omelets for breakfast. But uh, other than that, um, I, I'm pretty I, I'm pretty dependent on whatever. I, I always say I only cook two times in my life. I cook for nine months. Most women get that immediately. Men say what? So uh, we have two kids, two times in my life, I cook for nine months. So. Oh, God. <laughs> well, Teresa takes care of you, so she deserved those 18 months of relaxing and <laughs> breakfast in bed, maybe. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, honestly, that sounds delicious. Absolutely. It sounds pretty similar Absolutely. to how we eat, we eat, we yeah. eat I would right. say. Well, nice. Yeah, I'm trying to eat like you, so... <laughs> All right. Well, we have taken up a lot of your time. Uh, we really appreciate you hopping on the call um, and looking forward to posting this interview. I think it was a great discussion. So, yeah. yeah thank you so much. Thank Joel. you so much, Joel. And if you're open to it in the future, we'd love to come come visit your farm. Thank um, you. Do it. Do an in person interview, and then also just kind of experience Polyface firsthand. Yeah, um, share it with our social media. Yeah, for sure. We got a lot to do to catch up to the plant-based movement, Joel. A lot to do. Yes, we, we would love. We would love. To, yeah, we, one of the things that's happening this summer, uh, it, it, with with COVID and, and the shutdown of conferences and hotels and conference centers and all that stuff, is we. But but organizations still want to get together, and so uh, watch our website. We are actually uh, planning to host about six uh, gathering. We're calling it gatherings, and it'll be everywhere from Weston A. Price. Uh, peak, peak prosperity, uh, um, and uh, so you, you maybe you can coincide your visit with one of those, catch one of those gatherings, and um, uh, they're limited to 300 people. But uh, we're seeing a lot of interest sure. in, in a, out in the fresh air and, uh, and and to meet those those emotional social needs of people to still get together, hug and love each other uh, in a time when it seems like things are so uh, anti anti human. Yeah, I, I think that that sounds great. I think that's yeah. a good plan. We'll we'll stay in touch with um, a future visit if that's okay. 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 Well, Joel, you have my Super cell phone duper. number. Look forward to it. Thank you all. You have my cell phone and my email if you ever need anything from us. Thanks, but yes. we'll we'll talk with you soon. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, Joel. Thanks for all that you do. Appreciate it a lot. <laughs>